Sheeney, the Naira Infrastructure. I now call Claire Bailey to ask the first question. Ms Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question one. I guess Adam said on Ireland Infrastructure, I call the Minister for Infrastructure. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I have recently approved the award of a £16.5 million contract to build a new test centre and enforcement depot at Hyde Bank in Belfast, which are scheduled to open in autumn 2022. The new test centre will include facilities to safely deliver fully compliant emissions testing, and its design will be used as a template for further proposed test centres subject to further consideration and funding. The DBA currently conducts fully compliant diesel emissions tests on all heavy goods vehicles, buses and vans, over 3,500 um, and a partial diesel emissions test for cars and light goods vehicles. The partial test includes a visual inspection of the vehicle's emissions and a check of the engine malfunction indicator lamp, which indicates a defect in the vehicle emission control systems. Reintroducing full emissions testings will require the modernisation of the test centre network to create safe, sustainable environments for DBA staff and customers. This is a longer-term programme of work which will require substantial capital investment and is something I will be examining further in the coming weeks and months in order to ensure we can safely deliver a fully compliant diesel emissions test for cars and light good vehicles. Claire Bailey for a supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Minister, this has been going on for years and years, and we keep hearing that there are plans to deal with it. Could you give us today a time frame where we know that diesel, private and light goods vehicles will be checked, just as every other vehicle in Northern Ireland is? I agree with the member that this has been going on uh, a very long time. I have inherited the current network of vehicle test centres, which is over 40 years old and cannot support the introduction of a fully compliant diesel emissions test without significant capital investment. The DBA introduced a diesel emissions test for cars, light and heavy goods vehicles and buses in 2006 in compliance with the Roadworthiness Directive. However, for health and safety reasons related to the build-up of fumes in the test halls, and in consultation with the Health and Safety Executive for Northern Ireland, the emission test for cars and light goods vehicles was suspended in June 2006. Uh, but I can assure the member that upon taking up this post, it was an issue that I wanted to address, which is why I have allocated the capital funding. Uh, and we are looking to autumn 22, when we will see the new depot at Hyde Bank, which will include this facility. And I would be keen to see this rolled out across further um, depots in the coming years. Call Dorden Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers. Can the Minister give us an update on how she uh, sees moving forward an increase in the MOT of vehicles, the actual increase in capacity, and what has been done to try and accommodate the public inside the building in a safe and hygienic manner? Because at present, I understand they're left outside in the rain, which is totally unacceptable for our public. Um, so I thank the member for his question. Um, this is an issue that we have been aware of, the issue of um, customers um, having to wait outside the test centres. We are conducting a number of risk assessments and we're providing local arrangements um, at each of the MOT centres to facilitate customers. Uh, we are asking them and will be providing masks, but we're also asking them to be very mindful of social distancing and also uh, in terms of uh, hand gel and so forth to, to help with that. So we are trying to address that. The current capacity for vehicle testing at our MOT centres is approximately 30 per cent in comparison with levels prior to the pandemic and the lift issues. Uh, to meet increasing demand, the DBA is in the process of recruiting additional examiners and will also use overtime to provide additional capacity and cover for vehicle tests if due to a variety of unforeseen reasons such as sick evidence or the requirement to self-isolate, uh, examiners are unable to attend work. I am very conscious of the disruption that is being called, uh, caused to people uh, trying to access public facing services, um, but the COVID-19 restrictions mean that the DVI has had to adapt its services to ensure that they can be provided safely, uh, and we would ask customers for their patience um, at this difficult time. Vehicle testing capacity will increase as restrictions ease, and risk assessments are continually updated um, until such times as normal service delivery can resume. Call Roy Bakes. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Just last week, the Westminster Government decided to bring forward uh, the ban on new uh, fossil fuel vehicles to 2030. Uh, and that will have considerable reduction in emissions going forward. So what consideration has been given to the creation of a hydrogen hub in Northern Ireland? Because the, the emission from a hydrogen vehicle is water, and that is much preferable to what is being used at present. I thank the member for his question. Um, he is right. The UK government announced in early February that they are bringing forward their plans to ban the sales of diesel and petrol vehicles in the UK from 2040 to at least 2035. And the ban will also include hybrid vehicles um, for the first uh, time. Uh, my department are liaising with the Office for Low Emission Vehicles to consider what we need to do to meet this challenge. Uh, and the member will be also aware of the actions that we're taking to increase the uptake um, of electric vehicles. On the issue of the hydrogen hub, the member will know that shortly we are hoping to bring online three hydrogen fuel buses uh, with the hydrogen hub. That will be the first uh, on the island uh, of Ireland. And I also recently met with um, the Finance Minister, the Economy Minister and the DERA Minister as well to see what we can do to maximise the environmental and the economic benefits in terms of positioning Northern Ireland as a leader in the world of hydrogen. I call Joanne Bunting for a question. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question two, please. Um, as you will be aware, a number of members have raised this issue recently. Um, I recognise the importance of lighting, and this is key to enhancing greenways and to making people feel safe when using them. I also understand that during the dark evenings, we will still want to maintain the levels of walking and cycling on our greenways that we have seen, particularly during COVID. Lighting of the Cumber Greenway will require a public consultation and the design will need to be sympathetic to the environmental sensitivity of the route. My department is currently carrying out a preliminary design work for lighting the Cumber Greenway and following completion of an outline design for a lighting scheme of the Greenway, public consultation will have to be conducted and this will inform a decision as to whether or not the lighting should be installed. Joanne Bunting for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I'm grateful to the Minister for answering this regard because she'll know that the ducts were installed some a couple of years ago, I think. Um, she'll also know that the place is pitch black. Um, so she now, we now know for, for the whole of society the benefits of walking, particularly to mental health in these very uncertain times. People who are using that greenway uh, at dusk can be in the middle of it and all of a sudden it's, it's pure darkness, you can't see your hand in front of your face. And in the meantime there are cyclists, there are joggers, there are pedestrians, there are rabbits, there are dogs <laughs> and most importantly there's dog fouling. Um, so people need to see not just for safety but for practicalities of use of the Greenway. So I appreciate what the Minister is saying about a public consultation but she can't, can she give us any indication of a time frame? I can't give the member a definitive um, time frame at present. Uh, as I said, we are working through a design and then it will have to go out to um, consultation. The member will know, uh, as someone who uses the Greenway frequently, that there are a number of properties that back onto it. There is also the presence of bats in the area as well, and that will have to be factored through uh, into the design. But I want to assure the member that I am committed to seeing the rollout and the improvement uh, of existing uh, Greenways. I think it brings huge benefits to physical health, to mental health. I also think as the Cumber Greenway has demonstrated, Greenways can be a solution to a multiplicity of problems. So to reassure her that I want to advance this agenda and I'm very keen to work with councils. Indeed, the steering group that was established between the three councils and my department is meeting on the 9th of December. And I really hope that we can continue to make progress in partnership in terms of improving that asset. Call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I uh, thank the Minister for the work of her department to upgrade uh, to Can Crossing at the Branial section of the Cumber, or for the Conswater Community Greenway in East Belfast, and, and ask the Minister for an update on the work of her department with local councils to potentially transfer responsibility for the Cumber Greenway to councils, and therefore the ability to have high-level ongoing maintenance and upgrade of that community asset? I thank the member for his question. Um, and he was a, 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 
a very active campaigner uh, on the issue of the crossing um, and indeed shared a petition uh, that a number of the local residents had signed with me. Um, as I said, my, my department has established a steering group with agreed terms of reference to consider this matter. Uh, and as I, I stated in the previous answer, the next meeting is scheduled to take place on the 9th of December. The wider powers the councils have in respect of community development and health and wellbeing puts them in a better place to develop greenways as community assets. But I am very open to explore whether the three councils might capitalise on those opportunities, and that includes the option of transferring ownership to them. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank the ministers for her, Mr. for answers. Um, the Cumber Greenway, as with the Conwater Greenway, are an example for the people of East Belfast of how wonderful these facilities are. In South Belfast, my constituency in Carried Off, they're very keen to see progress. Can I ask the Minister for an update on that, and will she raise that with the relevant council whenever they have the meeting in the weeks ahead? I thank the member um, for his question. And it is clear um, the amount of correspondence that I've had on the issues of greenways that it's something that members uh, right across Northern Ireland feel very passionately uh, about. The member will be aware that I did announce the 20 million um, capital funding for blue-green infrastructure. Uh, I'm very keen to work with councils to see the further development of, of greenways. I am funding a number of, of greenways that are ready for construction this financial year. But we have also written out to, counts, to encourage councils to be developing their proposals so that we can get as many as possible to the stage that we can move them on to construction. So I'd be very keen to work uh, with the Council to see the development of greenways right across Northern Ireland and, of course, including carried off as well. Aram, sir, Jerry Carroll, on your case, I call Jerry Carroll. Question three. Climate change is the single biggest environmental challenge we face today, so it is vital that we work together towards a zero carbon future that delivers better outcomes for our people, our economy and the environment. There is an urgent need to reduce emissions in order to tackle the climate emergency we face and reach net zero as quickly as possible. As Infrastructure Minister, I have a clear agenda on climate change. My focus is on using available resources to green our infrastructure and deliver sustainable transport that connects people, unlocks our economic potential, protects our valuable environment and improves health and well-being uh, for all of our community. Where an application is made for planning permission, my department in dealing with the application must have regard to the local development plan, so far as material to the application, and to any other material considerations. Those other material considerations include the Regional Development Strategy 2035, the Strategic Planning Policy Statement, the Planning Strategy for Rural Northern Ireland, retained planning policy statements and supplementary planning guidance. This application was subject to environmental impact assessment, habitats regulation assessment and a public inquiry before the Planning Appeals Commission. My decision to grant planning permission was taken after consideration of all of the above and I am content that it properly considers any impacts on climate change. Thank the Minister for her answer. The Minister may or may not be aware the Wildlife and Natural Environment Act, Northern Ireland uh, 2011, in particular Article 31, makes it an offence to permit the carrying out of an operation which damages any feature of an area of special scientific interest. And the whole of Loch Ness is obviously one, and they shall be guilty of a, a criminal offence if they do so. And given that the removal of habitats by sand dredging creates unquestionable damage, never mind the fact that sand dredging uh, is still currently unlawful, isn't the Minister clearly committing a criminal act under this legislation by permitting further extraction, extraction that damages the uh, area of special scientific interest? I thank the member for his question. Um, I am an advocate for protection of the environment, and particularly a special one such as Loch Ney. The decision to grant planning permission for sand dredging on Loch Ney was taken in line with current planning policy and the environmental effects of the development have been the subject of rigorous assessment, including environmental impact assessment, habitat regulations, appropriate assessment and a public inquiry hearing. I have come to the view that there will be no adverse effect caused by the development on the loch in terms of its integrity or other aspects of its designated status, provided that suitable conditions and agreed measures are put in place. Given the importance of maintaining the integrity of the designated status of Loch Ney, my final decision will issue only when the Section 76 agreement with the applicant and relevant parties has been concluded to my satisfaction. 
The conditions and the Section 76 cover matters such as the area that can be subject to dredging, the amount of dredging that can take place and when it can take place. They also cover the system for monitoring these aspects of the operation. The conditions and the Section 76 between them will limit the number, size and operating times of the barges and will restrict the hours of operation of the downstream processing facilities. I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, following this decision, will the Minister commit at the very least to robust monitoring of the dredging at Lochney? I thank the member um, for her question, and, and as I outlined in the supplementary response to Mr. Carroll, uh, there are a number of, of conditions attached. Monitoring uh, is one, and it is one that my officials and I, as Minister, will take very seriously. Call Steve Aiken. Thank you very much indeed, and I thank the Minister for answers so far. Um, the Minister is aware that dredging has been permitted in a very limited area of Loch Ness. Does the Minister accept that even more significant environmental and economic damage would occur, would occur were we to import sand from elsewhere and also add significantly cost to construction and manufacturing industry here? Uh, the member makes uh, an important point, um, and we always, uh, as leaders, weigh up the environmental aspect and the economic um, aspect. I've been very clear in terms of the conditions that are being placed um, on this particular uh, situation, and that is to ensure that we can do what we can to protect our environment. Uh, but the member is also right to point out the contribution that it makes to the construction sector um, in particular. As someone who is very mindful of our housing shortage, and very conscious of the need to be able to build more homes. In order to do that, we have to make sure that we are in a position to be able to do so. So we have to consider all of those things in the round. But I hope this response and anyone who's been following this situation closely will take some reassurance from the fact that we have placed conditions on this, because I am very mindful always of the impact of the decisions that we all take on our environment. question for another hope. I am pleased to advise that my department has started the delivery of its winter gridding service since the 19th of October. Gridding on selected routes in the northern and western divisions has already been undertaken, and 330 tonnes of salt has been used to date. As part of planning for the winter gridding programme, my department ensures that adequate staff are available, that all winter service equipment is in satisfactory working order, and that there are adequate supplies of salt. There are also arrangements in place to supplement stocks of salt during the winter period if necessary. A full winter service will operate from the 19th of October until the 5th of April and will have approximately 300 staff and 130 gritters available and ready to salt main roads in order to help drivers across Northern Ireland deal with the wintry conditions. The average cost of providing winter service is £7 million, but can be as high as £10 million in more severe winter conditions. I have already allocated three million from the opening 2021 resource baseline budget as a contribution to funding for winter service, and a recent COVID bidding exercise provided a further five million funding for winter gridding services. I was disappointed that my further bid for two million was not successful in the October, October monitoring round. Uh, however, funding for the winter service will be reassessed as part of January monitoring, and a bid, um, any bid that is required, uh, will be submit, submitted by my department. Cash for your declaration. Supplementary for deck. I thank the minister for her response. The minister will be aware that myself, along with. Um, Ms. Sheeran behind me have been lobbying for quite a while now in relation to the, the B47 route uh, through the Spurns. Uh, it's a key route for people living up in communities like Crana for accessing services in, uh, in, in South Derry and Maharfelt and Balna Screen. Uh, so would the Minister give some further consideration to including that section of the B47 from Crana to Balna Screen on the, uh, the main written schedule? Thank you. I thank the member for his question, uh, and I am aware that he has, with his colleagues, been raising this, this issue. Um, under the present policy, 28% um, of the road work net network is gridded, which covers 80% of traffic volumes. Um, that is an, um, on an average cost of £7 million. If I were to extend that to, say, cover 90% um, of our uh, traffic, 
That would double the cost of the winter grinning service to up to £14 million. Uh, and if I were to extend it further to cover 100% of our traffic, we're talking um, an annual budget of £28 million for uh, winter grinning service. Uh, so my department has to operate within the policy to ensure that it is fairly uh, applied across the board in Northern Ireland. I would very much like to be in a position to do much more in terms of salting and grinning, but I have to operate within the policy and particularly within the financial constraints facing my department. Uh, Daniel McCrossan for a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, given COVID, what contingency plans are in place for winter services going forward? I thank the member um, for his question. Uh, my department has a staff sickness contingency plan in place, which ensures that initially efforts are directed towards motorways and the trunk roads before moving on to other main roads. Even with all of our available resources, it's unknown what impacts COVID-19 will have on our winter service. Uh, Traffic Information Control Centre is operational 24 hours, seven days a week, and will advise the public through Traffic Watch NI website and social media on any routes not salted due to staff sicknesses. Uh, but I want to assure the member this is something that we're very conscious of and that we are keeping our contingency arrangements under constant review. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for her answers, particularly with regard to winter pressures. I'm sure the Minister would like to uh, join me in uh, Road Safety Week and, and, and taking up the challenge by the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service today to kill your speed, um, given the problems that, that, that ice and snow causes. But as we know, uh, rainwater and water has been a problem over this past weekend. Would, would the Minister um, take a look at the A26 and particularly under the, the railway bridge and uh, the, the member from Lagan Valley will understand what I'm talking about with regard to near to, close to Moira. It floods absolutely every year. It's a main arterial route, one of the busiest roads in Northern Ireland. Would the minister um, give us an undertaking to, to look at that today, please? I thank the member for his question. Unfortunately, I don't have the detail uh, of that specific uh, road to hand, um, but I am content to speak with officials um, after question time and ask them to look into the matter and to report back to you. I call Chris Little. Question five. I thank the member for his question, and I know this is an area he is very passionate um, um, about. My department does not identify spend on walking and cycling separately, but includes funding for both in active travel. The um, attribution of span to active travel is also not a precise exercise, as some projects have benefits for active travel, even if they are not carried out specifically for that purpose. Other departments, councils and other agencies provide additional funding for walking and cycling promotion and infrastructure development. For example, we have recent commitments of many millions of pounds by a number of local councils for walking and cycling as part of their contribution to the greenways they are developing. I am not in a position to provide guarantees for active travel in relation to 2021-22, as the budget for that year has not yet been agreed by the executive, and therefore I do not know what budget my department will have next year. However, I can confirm that I am committed to investing in active travel and encouraging walking and cycling. And in demonstration of that commitment, I have appointed a walking and cycling champion in my department and invested a £20 million fund for the development of blue-green infrastructure, which will support the connection of communities and active travel. And I would expect to make further investments in active travel next year. Already this year, I have completed the new Blaris Greenway pop-up cycle lanes on the Dublin and Grosvenor roads, and I am continuing to develop more opportunities to put walking and cycling at the front of a green recovery for all our towns and cities. My September announcement indicated a total capital grant for the six greenways projects of 1.4 million this year and 2.3 million next year, um, and capital funding for these increased grants could be made available from the Blue Green Infrastructure um, funding. Chris Little for a supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her support for active travel. Does the Minister agree, however, that there has been underinvestment in active travel infrastructure, and would she consider an active travel act to make a minimum percentage spend of the Department of Infrastructure budget uh, a statutory on, on active travel a statutory responsibility? 
I thank the member for his question, and I do agree with his assessment that there hasn't been enough funding um, uh, in terms of encouraging and providing the opportunities for citizens to uh, walk and cycle. So it's something that I am committed to addressing. Uh, I also want to advise the member that I'm giving active consideration to um, an active travel bill. I've asked my officials to prepare a submission um, setting out a range of options in terms of how I can move this forward in terms of uh, policy changes, resourcing, but also uh, examining what we might be able to do in the legislative front as well. The Minister will obviously be aware of uh, the tragic death of another cyclist on a road five days ago. Uh, and without any knowledge of this specific incident, as a cyclist myself, I am well aware that without cycling-only infrastructure and additional cycling safety measures, further tragedies on our roads will unfortunately occur. Can I ask the Minister if she intends to review the Highway Code to explore ways uh, to strengthen that code with regard to cycling safety measures? I, I am aware of that fatality and I want to um, express my deepest sympathies uh, to the family uh, and to the, the friends of the person who lost their life. Um, I agree with the member that one of the best ways of encouraging people to cycle but also to ensure that they can do so safely is by providing cycling only uh, infrastructure. It's something that I'm very keen to be working with councils um, on uh, and I have to be honest um, as someone with very little patience I would like to see a much faster uh, pace of change but we are trying to do um, what we can. Uh, as part of my considerations around safe active travel I have asked officials uh, to have a look at what we may do in terms of reviewing the Highway Code, uh, and I'd be keen to provide updates to the APG on cycling, which I know the member um, is a part of. Gordon Dunn for a question. Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answers. Is the Minister convinced that she's getting it right in relation to priorities? I appreciate your enthusiasm for greenways, cycle lanes, and so on. But I think we, we need to get back to the basic principles of maintenance of our existing road structure. And are you convinced you're getting it right? If I look at my constituency in North Down, on the A2 was 45,000 vehicles per day. The roads are, the drains are blocked. The grass is cut after a strong campaign by ourselves twice a year. Um, weeds, weeds are growing wild on, on, on the verges, not just in my own constituency, but if you take Belfast, including South Belfast, which is now got an SDLP representative, the place is an absolute disgrace. Weeds are growing in footpaths. Weeds are growing in grass verges. I think, Minister, with all due respect, you've got your priorities wrong. We have a huge volume of vehicles. Yes, People could the member come to a question cetera, or he won't cetera. get an answer? I think. Appreciate. Question, please. Thanks very much. Thank you. You know, I, I thank the member, and I know that he is very passionate about his constituency. I don't believe in getting my priorities wrong. Um, the member will recall that um, in taking up my post, I said that we needed to get the basics right. That's why I have fully funded a 12-month repair for street lighting. It's why I have invested £8 million in LED uh, so that we're having the replacement of our street lights. It's why I have maintained the structural budget in our roads and set up a £10 million rural roads um, fund as well. But it's not a question of getting priorities right. It's a question of having the resource to be able to do what you want. The member will know that the Barton report said we should be investing £140 million per annum in our road network. I am in no way being allocated money to in any way touch the sides of that figure. So I want to bring about change in terms of active travel. I want to be making sure that people can be active and that they have better outcomes for their physical and mental health and in terms of the environment as well. But I do share the member's frustration. If I had much more money, I would be doing much, much more. And I now have time for a very brief question from Sinead Bradley, uh, followed by an answer. Question six, please. Um, I am fully committed to improving connectivity across the island, and I'm working with my counterparts in Dublin on a number of key all island projects aimed at improving the lives of people uh, across the island. This includes enhancing the rail network to create a spine of connectivity in the island, the A5 project, Narrowwater Bridge, and the Ulster Canal, all of which are commitments within New Decade New uh, Approach. The member will know that I've been engaging with Minister Ryan, and I know she has a particular interest in Narrowwater Bridge. Uh, and, uh, 
um, a joint party colleagues in a Zoom meeting with the Taoiseach on Friday night. Uh, he's giving updates to all parties on the Shared Island Unit uh, and the issue of narrow water and the multiple benefits that that project can deliver uh, were also discussed by both myself and the Taoiseach, which is news I know that the member will be greatly uh, delighted by. That concludes the period for listed questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call uh, Steve Aiken. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker. And may I ask the Minister, uh, although I do not believe the responsibility for airports should rely with the Department of Infrastructure and should actually lie with the Department of Economy, what additional support she, should be, she could consider for Belfast International Airport? Um. I thank the member for his question. Um, our local airports play an important role in growing our local economy, connecting people and business. And I am disappointed to learn about the reduced hours of operation at the Belfast International Airport, um, but understand how this reduction in the operations will help the airport reduce its cost base in light of reduction in scheduled services because of the COVID-19 measures. Um, the member is right. My department's remit is limited for airports, um, and I have agreed previously to meet with the airport, and I am committed to working alongside my ministerial colleagues, given the shared statutory responsibilities in this area, to explore what the executive can do to support the industry through this challenging time. Supplementary for Steve Egan. I thank the Minister for both her uh, comments and indeed her support for the uh, aviation sector in Northern Ireland. Uh, but as she is aware, Belfast International Airport is the only 24 hours operation airport in Northern Ireland. And it's not just a question of commercial aviation, it's a question of general av aviation. It's about fixed wing air ambulance support, it's about PSNI, and it's being available as an alternative diversionary airfield on the edge of the Atlantic as well. So it has significant implications. The fact that Northern Ireland does not have a 24 hour operational airport has a considerable impact, not just on our international reputation, but also on our business to grow and to maintain business going forward. Could the Minister uh, state whether she is willing to join with the Finance Minister to work together to get a specific bespoke package for Belfast International, so it can get back to 24-hour operation for the good of everybody in Northern Ireland as soon as possible? Uh, as the member has highlighted in his answer, um, the issue of airports cuts across a, a number of areas, policy areas, but also cuts across the statutory responsibilities of a number uh, of ministers. Um, so I can assure him that just as we did before, uh, I am committed to working with the Minister for Finance, but also the Minister for Economy as well, um, given her responsibility around airlines. And I believe that if we work together, then we can support and we should be able to support the industry through this incredibly difficult time. Here, I'm Sir Linda Dillon for your cash. I call Linda Dillon for a question. Gormay, can you? Thank you, and thank the Minister for her answers so far. Can the Minister give an update on the Rural Roads Fund? As the member will know, we have allocated um, £10 million for the Rural Roads Fund. Uh, that is being worked out across um, divisions. We are providing reports to all of the councils on the projects that have qualified for investment as part of the um, Rural Roads Fund, and those reports are all being made available on the council's websites. supplementary question for Linda Dillon. I appreciate your, your answer, Minister, and the fact that we will be able to get access to that online. Can the Minister also tell us, does her department have a strategy or any funding coming forward in terms of rural areas around short stretches of footpath that would make a big, big difference in terms of infrastructure, being able to walk to school, being able to walk to football clubs? At this moment in time, we, have, we are devoid of a strategy and we're devoid in many areas of any type of infrastructure. I am aware that this is an issue right across um, the north about the absence of footpaths to ensure that people can walk safely. And it does run counter to my ambition to have more people walking and cycling. Um, that's why I have set up the £20 million Blue Green Fund. But I've also been very clear I can't impose solutions from on high. I don't know communities. That's why I'm very much looking to councils uh, to be bringing forward proposals that I can financially support and work with them to try to progress. Um, we have had a focus on cities in terms of the initial rollouts and pilots, but I'm very conscious that we also see improvements um, right across the north. Call David Hilditch for a question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister, on the back of the PAC report, which was quite damning towards the uh, capital project delivery in Northern Ireland, some of which fall within our department, 
What is her thoughts on the report on the Potential Infrastructure Commission? I thank the member for his question. Um, and the member will know that I set up a ministerial advisory panel to look at this very issue. Uh, I understand that the panel has reported to the committee, uh, and I am sure that you know, the committee's support for this initiative remains just as it was when I went to discuss um, the matter. I am um, very keen to see that this has progressed with my executive colleagues. I have already met with the finance minister, and I have met with the um, dairy minister, and I am due to meet with the Education Minister and uh, the Communities Minister um, as well. I think there are real opportunities in terms of being more strategic in the planning and delivery of our infrastructure um, in its more holistic sense. And so I'm very keen to see how this can be progressed with my um, executive colleagues so that we can get into a better position in terms of that long-term planning um, and delivery um, of strategic infrastructure projects uh, going forward. Supplementary for David Hilditch. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her optimism and her, and her answer there. Uh, does she see the report sidelining the uh, Minister of Infrastructure in any way, that it would report directly to the Executive, or what takes place in the other devolved situations? I am sure that it does seem bizarre that you would have an infrastructure minister who is saying that they want to see an infrastructure commission that actually deals with issues outside of their department and does bring it to the executive. But it is not about a power grab for the infrastructure minister. It is about ensuring that we have the right mechanisms for delivering strategically our infrastructure project, minimising delays and doing it in the most efficient manner. We have to look at our competitors right across these islands. We look to New Zealand and cite it often as an example of how you can do things much better. All of these places have an independent infrastructure um, commission uh, because they have ambition, and I think that we should not have any less ambition. Call Keith Buchanan for a question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. A question to the Minister would be in relation to driving tests. If you could give us an update, Minister, on where we are at with driving tests going forward now after the, the recent relaxation of regulations now coming forward, and uh, what additional things you are putting in place to help them? Um, as the member will know, driving instructors were included in the executive's regulations on businesses that closed until the 13th of November to help stop the spread of COVID-19 and have now been further extended by the executive to the 20th of November. And following this executive decision, driving tests also ceased over this period of increased restrictions based on public health and the scientific um, advice. Uh, but I want to assure the member that we have work in order and that we will be recommencing driving tests on the 21st of November. I have taken a decision not to recommence it on the 20th because we are allowing a day for people to have their formal um, driving lessons if they so need to. Um, and in terms of creating additional capacity, uh, the DVA has opened up the booking system for February for the customers impacted by the recent um, restrictions. Um, over 2,000 additional booking slots have also been made available in November, December and January as the DVA increases capacity by recruiting additional examiners. And Once all customers who have had their tests recently cancelled have had the opportunity to rebook their appointments, the DVA will be opening up the booking service for all other customers um, in early December. The DVA will continue to offer driving tests on a Saturday and, following consultation with key stakeholders, is planning to offer driving tests for HGVs on Sundays. Um, and the DVA will also use overtime to rota off shift dual role driving examiners to provide additional capacity and to provide cover for scheduled driving tests where, due to a variety of unseen reasons such as sick absence or the requirement to self isolate, driving examiners are unable to attend work. Keith Buchanan for a supplementary. Thank you and thank the Minister for answer so far. Minister, I have concerns regarding uh, how you are going to catch up with the backlog. I appreciate cars for MOTs, you are fit to give a TEO and not let those people drive on. I con have concerns that as well for the amount of work that uh, garages is not doing now. So there are cars on the road that are not safe. I know it is up to the individual to make their own car safe. But my question is, how are you going to increase the percentage numbers? Because 100 per cent is only going to sit still and drive in uh, tests for people. You need to increase that by 100% to catch the back, by another 100% to catch the backlog, because there's thousands and thousands of young people out there. Many have contacted my office in regard to they've been turned down once, turned down twice, and they're trying to get dates. I think one or two more uh, people is not going to, you know, do it. We need we need a massive increase of percentage to get this backlog caught up. 
I, you know, I know that there is disruption being caused to learner drivers. That's why I've taken the decision to further extend the validity of their theory test pass certificates, it's trying to reduce the disruption to them. But undoubtedly, disruption is being caused. It is a public-facing service, and all public-facing services are being impacted by COVID. I do want to assure the member, though, that it's not just a case of recruiting one or two additional examiners. Uh, we are recruiting 27 um, additional temporary and permanent um, examiners. We are looking at testing on a Saturday and Sunday to free up capacity uh, as well, and we will continue to look creatively uh, to do what we can to try to increase and maximise the number of people that we can give driving tests to, while also being mindful of the public health advice and the need to adhere to the risk assessments that we have carried out. Here, I'm sir, John O'Dowd for Hanya Cash. I call John O'Dowd for a question. Minister, what consideration has your department given to the provision of a rail halt in central Craigavon? Um, I haven't to date been able to give very active consideration to it. I am struggling in terms of trying to make sure that our public transport network remains viable under the current conditions, given that we have seen such dramatic falls in passenger numbers. But I, as I have said, my job is, yes, to protect the existing uh, public transport network in terms of bus and rail, but I also want to see it improved and enhanced. And we will continue to make representations to executive colleagues to ensure that we can get the finance that we need to see the enhancements to the network that the member has rightly highlighted. Case Darlene Tuck, John O'Dowd. A supplementary question is John O'Dowd. I appreciate the, the pressure the Minister's Department is under and indeed the entire executive, and I wouldn't expect her to be able to turn around and say I'm building that within a short time. What I want to do is ensure that it is in the mindset of the Department that we do need to expand our rail network and we need to be imaginative in the provision of further rail halts, particularly along that main Belfast uh, to Dublin Rhine. The, if we were to provide a rail halt in Central Hergallon, it would lift the traffic congestion out of Lurgan and allow Lurgan to return to the market town that it could specialise in in terms of its trade. The member does not need to persuade me of the merits of it. I, I can see it and I, and I share his enthusiasm for it. Um, it is an issue of finance, but there is also an opportunity. Uh, my department is currently uh, working on it, the regional um, strategic transport plans, and they will go out for consultation. And That is an opportunity for members and for members of the public right across the north to be responding to that and to be sharing their views and ambitions of what they would like to see in terms of public transport provision in their local communities. So I would encourage, when they are published, uh, members but also their constituents to respond to it so that I can be clear on their views. And if we turn around this next one, we can get question and answer in. Uh, Aram, sir, Cahal Boylan, for your cash, I call Cahal Boylan. Car Margaret, uh, Laskin, Carly, I just could ask the Minister when can those in the bus and coach operators sector and also the taxi sector expect their COVID payments from Mr. Margaret? Thank the member for his question. Um, the member will know that I was given new powers uh, for the financial scheme on the 3rd of November. Ten days later, I opened the taxi um, scheme. Uh, it opened on Friday, and at close of play, there were around 2,000 applications um, to that. Um, we, I have committed to ensuring the payments are out. Um, from that scheme um, before Christmas, because I understand that people are finding it very difficult financially. In terms of the bus and coach sector, um, that scheme will open next week. Okay, if members will take their ease, please, and uh, we'll uh, change round speakers and the topics.